Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight, psychiatrist Norman Doidge, author of The Brain's Way of Healing. Mohsin Hamid, the author of The Reluctant Fundamentalist, whose latest book of essays examines the world from New York, London and Lahore. Funeral worker Caitlin Doty, whose memoir from the crematorium is called Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. Canadian novelist and artist Douglas Copeland, whose latest book is called The Age of Earthquakes and it's a guide to the extreme present. And international journalist Christina Lamb, the author of Farewell Kabul. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. Now, our Facebook audience suggested we talk about the West and Islam, the migration crisis and brain plastic plasticity. And we will get to those topics shortly. But our first question tonight comes from Noella Brickle Dobbins. Caitlin, you're an advocate for families hanging on to their dead to prepare them for burial. I understand that having worked as, norm, as a mortician, you've had experience with this sort of preparation. However, with all the heartache, pain and anguish, how can you justify your stance? Sure. So, so my stance is that families should be more involved in caring for their dead loved ones. And what's happened in the past hundred years in the whole Western world is that death has become professionalized, meaning a professional will come in, you pay them, they take care of everything surrounding the dead for you. And in some ways, that's a nice way to push away the pain a little bit. But I would argue that the real moving, engaging, intimate healing process comes from the interaction with the dead body and the family interacting with now, the dead you body. You made a conscious decision to look death in the eye, as you put it, and uh, actually go and work in a crematorium or crematoria, as I think they call them in California. Yeah. Um, so why did you do that? And, and what did you get from that? Because uh, in a way, you were challenging yourself, I think. Absolutely. I, I was fascinated by, by death from a young age. I witnessed a, a difficult death of a girl falling off a balcony when I was about eight years old. And death had haunted me. And in the Western world, we don't have a lot of interaction with death. We don't have a lot of way to see it as it really is. And I wanted to see what was going on behind the scenes. I wanted to see what it was like to work in a crematorium, the dead bodies, the grief, uh, the decay, everything that was, that was real that I didn't feel like I really got in my daily life, in my internet life, in my, in my world, my very sterilized world. And so I, I got a job at a crematorium and it completely blew my world open. Well, yeah, I mean, here's a quote from your book. A girl always remembers the first corpse she shaves. She does, yeah, <laughs> true. But it's an interesting, I mean, it's an interesting way of putting it. You put it almost like a, an encounter with a lover. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, <laughs> not, not really that way, but yeah, um, no, obviously not. <laughs> that's taking the whole show in a different direction. <laughs> but, um, but you did compare it to losing your virginity. Um, it, it, well, again, not, not that. This is, people are going to get the wrong idea <laughs> about this book. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, it is an incredibly intimate experience because most people, we don't see dead bodies. I mean, how many of you have seen a dead body? Raise your hand in your life, a real dead body. That's, that's a larger amount than I usually get in wow, audiences in, in the U.S. To see that I'm well. surprised, to see, surprised to see that many people. Um, and if we do see a dead body, it's been made up. Um, or in, in the United States, chemically embalmed, chemically preserved. And so we don't really have the sense of this is a real dead body. This person isn't here anymore. They're not coming back. And surprise, as this person is, so you too will be. Someday you'll be dead too. Now, um, I'd like to bring in the other panellists. But before we do that, we've got another question on this subject from uh, Rowan Walters, and we'll bring Rowan in, then we'll bring the other panellists in to yeah. reflect on what you Thank you, Tony, and um, thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, just on this this actual subject, death became very, very immediate and close and personal to me in 1992 when I witnessed the death of my father who'd been seriously ill for a very long time. I was actually in the room when his life ended and it was probably one of the most painful and yet powerful uh, experiences of my entire life because, you know, in one moment there was this man who was my best friend, mentor, my father. And within the space of seconds, it was a lifeless body. And the life had gone and he just wasn't there anymore. And it felt, we could actually feel, those of us in the room actually felt him leaving. So that's when death particularly became very close and personal to me. But my question was, have we in the West really institutionalised our fear of death and ageing 
to the point where it just becomes so remote, mm. making it something that's constantly out of mind and out of sight. And as you said, very abstract. I'll come back to you on that question, Kate. I'd like to hear from sure. the other panelists first. Mosin. Well, I think that um, I think it's it's actually very dangerous to to banish death in that way and to become disconnected from it. In in my own life, um, most recently, a couple of years ago, uh, one of my uncles passed away, and uh, generally in in our family, um, the the body of the person who's passed away is bathed. Um, you know, by the women of the family, and then um, the men of the family uh, take the body, which is shrouded in a white cloth, um, on a stretcher and carry it on their shoulders to the grave. And you can imagine eight people carrying it. The last two will drop off, and two more will come in front. And so everyone who's close to this person has a chance to to to, to share in, in carrying. And in this case, uh, when my uncle passed away, the grave was you know a rectangular uh, ditch hole in the ground. Um, and you know, I, I had to stand inside the grave uh, you know, to help the lowering of, of, of my uncle's body into the grave. Um, and it, it was a, you know, a, a very strange um, and, and powerful um, you know, feeling to be standing in the grave in that way, to be you know, uh, the weight of a human body, who this person was, is. Um, so I, I think that certainly it's not the case that everywhere uh, we've become disconnected. Um, and I do think that, that when we do become disconnected, there, it's, it's, it's very dangerous because it's the truth of what it is to be human and it's the truth of what it is to love someone. Mm -hmm. And so I think to not experience that truth, which is the ending of it, um, it it's potentially a very um, dangerous phenomenon. Norman Deutsch, why, um, you're a psychiatrist, uh, perhaps you could look at it from that perspective, but why is it that we fear uh, death and contact with death so profoundly in the West? Well, I don't know why, frankly, why it's, it's uh, the fear of contact is more profound. There, there's so many things that have been industrialized in the West, um, so it, it just may be part of that. I, but I, I do want to say that I agree with uh, Caitlin and Mosin, that uh, it's deeply problematic. The other thing, of course, to keep in mind, though, is uh, the, uh, one of the things, particularly in mobile parts of, of the West, like the United States, where families are living apart, is they don't have the, family, the kinds of family support that you had in earlier societies um, where people you know, were born in a village and died in a village. And uh, that's the, the other part of all of this, that it's uh, to be able to confront it naturally and directly is, I think, really important in helping people grieve in a natural way. Uh, but with fractured families and people everywhere else, it's going to e be even harder for people to do that. So yeah, Caitlin, I think how, how both you, I mean, you belong to or a part of the order of the good death? I mean, how do you, how do people in this sort of industrialized society do this better? Is there a way? Are there? Yeah. Methods. Well, that's that's kind of the big question that I'm working on, and I'm opening a funeral home in Los Angeles, and I was just in Tokyo. I just came here from Tokyo, and they have a very advanced. You know, we're talking about um, corpse hotels where the family can come in and stay with the dead body because there's no place in the home anymore. They live in tiny apartments, and they're not able to keep the whole family there and invite people from out of town. And society in these big cities just doesn't work the way that it did before. So the question is, how do you still have rich how do you still have people connected to the dead body, connected to the experience? Because like, like you said, and like Mosin said, it's important to have that moment and that experience and that tangible feeling. Because nobody who's done it goes, it was so fun and amazing, I loved it. They don't say that. But what they do say is that it was profound and it was complicated and it made me understand humanity a little more. And if we're not doing that, if we've taken everything away, medical system and death system, we're not getting that experience. Christina. I see a lot of death in my job as a war correspondent and covering disasters. And so I sort of feel like I don't want to see more death than that. Um, but of course, the people I'm seeing killed or dying are not people that I've known, mostly. Um, I do feel that I suppose most of us, because we're living longer, are going to die in hospital. And we probably would rather the people 
that we love remember us as being kind of young and vigorous and doing things rather than sort of dying in a hospital bed. So I'm not so convinced that we want to see death up front. What I do feel is that, you know, in Victorian times, people used to go to graveyards and picnic and that, you know, that we could respect death a little bit more and think about the people that we've lost more afterwards than we do now. Now, Douglas, uh, death is one of the great subjects of art, one of the great subjects for artists over many years. I mean, has it engaged you? And what are your thoughts about this idea that we keep it at arm's length in Western society? I remember reading Jessica Mitford's The American Way of Dying like two decades ago, and it sort of sensitized me to the issue, and I've been following things ever since. Funerals are so hyper-monetized, like, like, here's the urn, do you want the deluxe urn? Oh, this casket here, oh, here with the brass model, etc. And it all seems to me to be very creepy, and you're opening your own mortuary, I yeah, guess, in home. Los Angeles. How are you going to take the creepy out? How are you going to make it human? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Yeah. Um, yes, a corpse hotel doesn't really do it for right, me. Right. Right. Actually, that was uh, that was an amazing model because what it was. So, so the funeral home that I have, first of all, I try and be less creepy, which I think helps um, as a person. But also, there's we're not we're not going to sell much of anything. What we're doing is we're saying we can come into your home and help you take care of the dead yourself. Oh. Or you can come and witness the cremation with us, um, watching the body being loaded in and pressing the button to start the cremation. We can have a natural burial where you can come and actually dig the grave, like you were, you were saying, and put the body in yourself. Um, so it's all about family involvement. And we're not really selling you anything other than our time and the the actual process. Do you, you actually think you'll get people lining up to press the button? Uh, they they sounds... do. People, people really love, and it happens in, in um, Buddhist cultures do it. Oh, okay. um, uh, in, in Hindu culture, it's important to be able to the oldest son to light the pyre um, of the person who has died. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of cultures have a precedent for being involved in the cremation and starting, starting them off, sending them off. Well, there you have your answer, um, Douglas. Does... Well, I, I see what Mosin was saying about standing in, in the grave itself and feeling the weight, that there does need to be a more human connection there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've only been to a few funerals in my life, but only one that was open casket, and that was so long ago. And it did, I did feel alienated and unconnected from what was actually going on. So good for you for making it. So it, it did occur to me when uh, reading some of your thoughts that uh, you actually have the view that time is speeding up, um, that we are actually entering a phase uh, because of the information age where everything's oh. accelerating. Does that mean mortality is coming closer as far as you can see? I, th there's Industrial scientists have figured out that the natural human attention span is about two and a half minutes long. Uh, or the, about the length of a Beatles song, and that's not a coincidence. The reason that pop songs are the song... We're going to have to hope that's not true tonight. No, the, the, reason, <laughs> the reason that pop songs are the length they are because after two and a half minutes, your brain's like, okay, I want to do another task. Mm. So if you work in an office, email, and then two and a half minutes later, work, and then coffee, what have you. Um, and it, before the internet era, that was not necessarily an impulse that was indulged. Well, there's nothing else to do, so I might as well just continue what I'm doing. And you got into longer trains of thought. But now our attention spans are somewhat shattered. I had to find a book to read on the plane coming down here. And I was in a bookstore yesterday, in a great big bookstore, and I was just walking around. And I, Nothing in this store is going to make my brain feel the way it does when I'm on the internet. And that kind of creeped me out. Creep, there's that tonight's word, I guess. Um, and, and if you're always having that interruption-driven memory going on, like boom, 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 at the end of a year, did that year feel like a year? Like, you know, that it's not just getting older and your sense of time organically shifting. I, I think time's the same length it always has been, but our perception of it is really accelerated, I think. Yeah, and uh, very briefly, I, I'm just wondering if the internet has changed the way we think about death and mortality, because I remember oh. uh, Timothy Leary, for example, tried to digitise his entire personality in the last... He had a little group of people in his garage doing this, tried to digitise his personality oh. to make him immortal before he died. Um, I, I did a number of paintings and works that dealt 
with 9-11, and particularly the very, very problematic issue of jumpers. Uh, and I was talking about this with my mother, and she's 78, 79. And so, well, you know, have you gone online, and, and, she, and she's a click junkie like you know, anyone else. And did, did you look up jumpers? And well, yes, I did, just, just once, but that was enough. And I think that we're now in a situation where once is enough, but you never used to be able to even see that. You can actually see, oh, that's what it's like now. Or you can go to, uh, was it Ease, I forget the name of the site, but military, like uncut raw military footage and photography. It's like, oh, oh man. And so you see the actual unsanitized versions of things now. And so you can't really pretend that you're innocent in a way that you could maybe fake in the past. Let's move on because we've actually got some questions which uh, take us into that general field. Our next question comes from Gary Nunn. Are euphemisms always dangerous? Um, the ones that we use for deaf are comforting, but they create a taboo. Prime Minister Abbott's obsessive use of the term deaf cult to describe Islamic State may be ill-advised, but isn't his bluntness here better than some of the euphemisms that conceal the uncomfortable truths. Caitlin, we'll start with you again. Ooh, um, I, I did see the video, the super cut of him just going, death cult, death cult, death cult, death cult. Um, and I guess he said it like 350 times or something in the past couple weeks. Um, I, I don't know, I'm and certainly not. That was all not... in one interview. Right, yeah, it's one <laughs> single interview, single super cut of an interview. Um, yeah, th that's a really complex question, but I, I do wonder, death cult is almost a, there's so much in the, in the world that we, or in the Western world that we fetishize with death. You know, if we do see death, we see it in crime shows and we see it in zombies. And, and to call it a death cult to me almost does feel uh, fetishized. It feels, it feels like it, it's something that would be almost attract someone to it as opposed to repel them. So I don't, I don't, it almost means maybe is a euphemism for, for what the complexities of the actual group. Norman Doge, what do you think? What's the question? Well, the question, <laughs> the question was um, about the bluntness, where it's better to be blunt and refer to something oh, as a death okay. cult than use some other kind of euphemism to describe it. Well, I, I, I don't want to be pres you know, prescriptive and say euphemism is always bad. Uh, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it, it's good. I mean, even talking about this whole issue with families. Uh, yeah, you want the grown-ups to be able to face death. Do you want the six-year-olds to be there or, or not? I mean, these are questions you, yes. you want to... Yes. Okay. Yes, that's what I would say. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd have to think about that. I mean, sometimes I think it... I'd want to see, I think it could be just too overwhelming for, for, for kids sometimes, um, but maybe that's just because I've been raised in this industrialized version of it. Uh, Take it back to the, uh, to the question which was about um, the use of death cult to describe Islamic State or ISIS. Um, what do you think about the psychology of mm -hmm. terrorism in that regard? Because uh, uh, well, as Caitlin yeah. was just saying, the death cult sort of fetishizes the idea to such a degree that it might, in fact, be attractive to some well, young people. Yeah, I mean, it might fetishize it. I, um, well, it's not. It's not a. It's not um, a celebration of life. It's not. It does seem to have to do with death, um, for sure. I mean, just structurally, if you look at what ISIS is about, there's a heavy, heavy emphasis on the afterlife, and when you have a religion, this is something Nietzsche, the philosopher, pointed out, that heavily emphasizes the afterlife it tends to minimize the here and now to some degree, which makes the idea of martyrdom less onerous or frightening. And it makes the idea of taking someone else's life uh, in some ways less disturbing. And of course, there is a lot of talk about death. Now, is it a cult? Um, ISIS has got mass movement qualities about it. It certainly, you know, it has native people who are attracted to it, you know, in Syria and Iraq, and it has people here, many of whom, uh, I can at least speak from the Canadian experience, are, are, are very troubled people who, like many people who join cults or mass movements, are often young people, young men, who feel their lives have been a failure, and they are trying to, um, in a way, erase their current self by joining a cult 
which tells them how to live, or a mass movement, um, at which has, tends to have spectacles and rituals that have to do with death to create awe in the young people. So, I mean, there are cultish qualities. There have been, there have been cults that are violent, but a lot of them aren't violent. I'd have to understand the context that the prime minister is using it in to, to know. Uh, but there is something trance-like about ISIS, the use, the use of drugs, propaganda, not letting people um, stray from it or uh, at pain of death. Um, Let's hear from uh, Mohsen's uh, written, uh, obviously, about Islamic extremism at different times, fundamentalism. Um, what are your thoughts on um, whether ISIS is or is not a death cult? I mean, I don't, I don't really... Um, well, a few things. First of all, um, I don't know any more about ISIS than anybody else in this room. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, I think that um, sometimes we get caught up in these words, you know, death cult. Um, and I'm a writer, so words are, are my profession. But um, to me, it's more interesting, what are we actually talking about? You know, what's underneath this? And, and I think that um, there are a couple of, of big sources of the appeal of something like ISIS, I would imagine. And I, I often think that one of the ways of, of, of imagining this is, is what would convince you to join something like this? Put yourself in the, in the shoes of somebody who goes and joins. What, would, what might make you feel that way? Yeah, I, um, I probably wouldn't think a video of uh, people beheading uh, well, other people would be a good advertisement, so, for example, so, so but it appears to be. Let's, let's, so let's break our, our, our market, since it's a marketing exercise. These mm. videos are basically a, a kind of marketing exercise. Let's break our market into different segments. You know, there is perhaps a psychopathic segment for whom the idea of being invited to behead people is attractive just as an opportunity to behead people. Um, then there is perhaps a group of people who are exactly as you were saying, I think as young people, particularly young men, you know, throughout history have, have had this desire to go out and slay dragons, to be heroes, you know, to do this. Sorry, go ahead. Doug. Can I interject yeah. here? This is actually a God-given moment to ask a question. Uh, in the marketing world, um, they know that the music that people get most sentimental about later on in their life is the music that was playing when they were 23 years old. So if you're ever trying to uh, attract a demographic segment for a car or, or you know, anything, you just go back in time to whatever was playing in 1990, whatever, what have you. And that I looked it up, and the average age of the typical recruit for I, ISIS, ISIL, is 23. Mm. And I wonder, which is also, I guess, the age of the average soldier, and I'm, is there something Norman that's sort of built into us as a species that there's this sort of something that happens around 23 where you have an altered sense of risk assessment or something goes on in the brain, and maybe this is nature's way of just having people go off to war for whatever the war of the day is. Let's, um, I, I won't go straight to you because we've got a question that's sort of relating to this. It's from Robin Clay Williams. We'll go to that. Thank you. Um, this is to the panel, and I guess it does relate to it. Um, mythologist and uh, writer Joseph Campbell talks about the hero's journey as the way to fulfilment and maturity. Um, many popular internet games are based on this story. Uh, is it the lack of opportunity to enact this hero's journey in real life that's feeding the rise in radicalisation in our youth? Yeah, Christina, can I bring you in there? I think it's really difficult. I mean, there are thousands of people all over the world at the moment trying to understand why what is attracting young people to go and join ISIS? And I think there is no single answer. I think there are people who are attracted by this idea of going and joining some kind of sunny utopia as they see it. I mean, ISIS is a bit different to Al-Qaeda in that Al-Qaeda is attracting people to go and be a martyr and go and kill yourself and have the 72 virgins and uh, much more about the afterlife. I, I, ISIS seems to be trying more to attract people to be part of this caliphate, this Sunni utopia. Um, and there's lots of people out there blogging quite astonishing things from um, inside the heart of ISIS in Syria and Iraq, saying to young people, come and join and you'll have a villa with free electricity and a swimming pool and kittens and all sorts of kind of unlikely things. And of course, the reality of it is, is nothing like that at all. And it's quite difficult for us. I mean, I, I remember after 9-11, when we were trying to understand why people had 
become the hijackers um, taking the planes and killing all these people. 15 of the 19 were from Saudi. So I went to Saudi Arabia, I went to this particular town, Abba, where five of the suicide bombers came from. And at that time, we all kind of imagined that they would be poor, uneducated people. And when I went to the town and talked to their friends and relations, they weren't like that at all. They were educated, quite affluent people, um, young people who liked playing guitar and loved music. And so it was really hard to understand, you know, what it was that had made can I, them. Can I interrupt you just life. there to bring uh, Mosin in? Because your book, The uh, Reluctant Fundamentalist, has a key character called Chang Changes. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, here's a kind of epiphany uh, while watching the attacks on the uh, September 11 attacks on the Twin Towers in particular, where he finds himself actually feeling um, good about this. It's good from his point of view to see America brought to its knees. And he catches himself because he's in a room full of Americans and who obviously don't feel the same way. Um, what were you reflecting there? Was it, was it sort of some secret view of your own or a view that you understood to be true? Uh, you know, I was in a gym when I saw the uh, video footage of September 11, 2001, and um, I was in London. And I walked into this gym because somebody had said there was something happening in New York, and I had just moved to London from New York. And my former roommate um, worked you know, at the World Financial Center right next to the World Trade Center. So I, I walked in. And being a writer, I was watching what was happening. Uh, and I tried to call my roommate and I couldn't get through like many of the people trying to call New York that day. Um, but I also was watching the people around me watch the video. And, and one person next to me was smiling. And this was a you know, European looking person or somebody of, of, with, with, I don't even know if that's a statement that makes any sense, but somebody who did not look to me evidently Muslim. Uh, although, of course, we know Muslims can look like anything, um, but was smiling. And, and so, of course, we know that people smile you know, at, at funerals and at, at, at very sad events sometimes, that you're overcome by emotion and you smile. But I kind of had a feeling that this maybe wasn't that. And, um, and then you know, I, I saw video footage of people celebrating. I got emails you know, from people who were pleased. Um, and, and that idea that people were pleased, and decent people, um, uh, intrigued me, and I, and, I, and I began to think about this notion that um, it's possible to separate in one's mind the, you know, the horrific, um, atrocious, you know, uh, atro just, just uh, massacre of thousands of our you know, fellow human beings from a kind of symbolic act, a political act, um, and that people do this all the time. And so in the novel, uh, Chinggis has this reaction and he's, he feels torn because on the one hand, he's quite in love with America and doing quite well in America. On the other hand, he feels a strange kind of almost tribal affiliation that says he's happy that America is hurt. And, and, I, and one thing I'd just like to say about this is that um, we were talking a bit earlier about you know, who gets attracted. There's the heroic quest of the person who gets attracted. There's potentially the psychopath. But I think there's also um, a group of people uh, you know, in a way like Chinggis in the novel, who feel divided, um, you know, to, who feel that they're of two worlds. And in my own life, um, I have felt this in the sense of spending part of my childhood in California and part of my uh, childhood in Pakistan and part of my adulthood in the States and the UK and part of my adulthood in Pakistan. When I was younger, when I was in America, I tried to act much more American. When I was in Pakistan, I tried to act much, much more Pakistani. And it wasn't until my late teens or early 20s that I began to think, this is a bit of a strange thing to do. Why don't I just act like myself? Um, and I think there's enormous pressure on us to, in a way, pick sides, to say that if I am two things, that's wrong. I should be one thing. And so then people engage, I think, in an act of, of enormous uh, psychic violence towards themselves to say, no, no, I can't be both things. And I think what we should be asking ourselves as societies, you know, places like Australia and, and the UK and the US, and of course, Pakistan, um, is you know, to what extent do we create conditions where people who feel they belong to two different things um, aren't encouraged to accept themselves as mongrel, of, as both, and instead are encouraged to pick one 
in fact, are asked to pick one, are expected to pick one. Or do you think um, in so certain circumstances they get pushed in one direction or feel that they've been pushed in I one direction? So. I think so. I think, I think, you know, what, what one sees is, is so many people, as you say, you know, get, you know guitar playing terrorists, you know, rock band loving uh, suicide bombers. Um, there is clearly, it's not just a narrative of somebody who is, you know, an out and out death cultist, you know, usually. Um, it's, it's oftentimes, I think, there are people who, like young people everywhere in the world, and older people too, are confused about what their identity is. And, and generally speaking, we live inside societies that, that perhaps increasingly um, want us to not be confused. You know, which cricket team do you cheer, cheer for if you're a Pakistani Australian? The Pakistani team or the Australian team? Um, what's your, you know, where do you really stand? And I think, for me, in a way, that, that, that um, that outlook is quite natural, but it's very dangerous because it's just like asking a child, you know, um, between your mother and your father, um, who do you love? Which one are you really with? Mm. And as we give birth in our societies to people who have, you know, mongrelized mixed backgrounds, to ask them that question and to be unable to accept the idea that they can love both their parents, both of their origins, um, is to put enormous pressure on people. Um, I'm not saying that justifies terrorism, but I'm saying that I do think that we need to examine that and think about the context in which in societies we create an environment where we want people to choose and, and in a way we want them to do a monstrous act upon themselves. I think that's really true and that's why um, things like the Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo are so damaging because they play into the hands of people who want to use those kind of to say everything that the West does is bad. So if you're one of those people that is divided and confused and trying to sort of fit into two things and then you see something like that happening to your people, then obviously you're going to feel like you should do something about it. I think we'll leave that subject there for a moment because we could talk about for the rest of the programme. We've got lots of interesting questions on other subjects. Our next question comes from Oliver Damien. Um, thanks to uh, Australian skateboarder Oliver Perkovich's non-profit Skatistan, skateboarding is now the number one sport for girls in Afghanistan. It also has the highest proportion of female skateboarders in the world, simply because of a loophole in the Quran, which unlike other sports, does not specifically prohibit skateboarding for women, maybe because it's so new. <laughs> Could this be a less confrontational way to diffuse radical Islam, you know, by looking for loopholes where inroads to moderation can, can be made. <laughs> I'll start with Christina on that. We spent some time <laughs> in Afghanistan. Um, so I visited the Skatistan project, which is fascinating. And I mean, it's wonderful to see these kids who have had nothing but war for so many years and have no toys. I mean, Afghan kids just don't have anything in their houses to have the freedom of riding on a skateboard. I'd be surprised if it's the number one sport among Afghan girls, actually. I've only seen it uh, in Kabul, but... Um, they are, they're forbidden to ride bicycles as they are yes, in Saudi Arabia, are. so if you want to get round on something with wheels, that's your only no, choice. But there is an Afghan... I have to correct you, sorry, Tony, but there's an Afghan women's cycling team who are amazing, so um, there, there is... <laughs> OK, well, let's slap our researchers on the wrist. <laughs> 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 um, I must say, with the skateboarding I mean it, it's great and it, I, a lot of it is for street children in Kabul and I went to see the project in 2009 when I was very depressed about what was going on in Afghanistan and I thought I want to write something more uplifting and positive and one of the problems in Afghanistan is the ethnic differences and particularly between the Pashtuns and the Tajiks so I was told that in this project they have all sorts of people from different tribes and they all play together. Um, when I went to see them, the Pashtuns were fighting the Tajiks and hitting each other with the skateboards. So it didn't work quite as I had imagined. Um, I mean, this is a culture where people love fighting and they fight with everything, even with the kites, have broken glass on the strings to cut down. 
and um, they fight with boiled eggs as well. So it's sort of, I mean, it's play as well as fighting. But um, so I didn't maybe see the best of that project, but I no, know it doesn't that sound like it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. Admit. So just to, just briefly um, on the broader question of women in Afghanistan and if you like in Pakistan as well, since you wrote the book about Malala or with Malala. Um, can you just give us your, briefly if you can, uh, your sense of what will happen, for example, when uh, the West pulls out completely out of Afghanistan and, and will that flow further into Pakistan? I feel really strongly about this because, um, as you probably remember, after 9-11, one of the big issues about going and taking on, removing the Taliban regime was the treatment of women. And all these promises were made by President Bush and Tony Blair and others about how um, women would be free in Afghanistan and they would have a new life. Um, now, things have certainly improved for some women in Afghanistan, and there's a lot more girls at school. There's about two million girls at school, whereas back in the time of 9-11, there were very few, in fact, none officially, but lots at secret schools. Um, what I fear is, though, I mean, the situation, it's still really one of the worst places in the world to be a woman, to be honest. You probably saw that case recently. Fakunda, the 27-year-old um, trainee teacher who was burnt to death in Kabul. Um, she was set fire to, she was driven over by a Toyo to pick up, and then she was thrown in the Kabul River. Um, and afterwards, people then came out and protested at what had happened. And these very brave Afghan women held her coffin. We're going back to the funeral and death theme. But, um, and that was unheard of in Afghanistan for women to come and um, hold a, a coffin at a funeral. So a lot of people took a positive thing from that and said this shows that things are changing. But I have to say, the fact that a 27-year-old woman can be brutally killed by a mob in the middle of Kabul, in the middle of the day, a mile from the presidential palace. What caused it to happen, Also briefly? shows, you know, how bad things are. Well, um, there were all these men outside. She, this was by a shrine, and they were selling fake amulets. And um, she was very religious and said to them, you shouldn't be fooling people with these fake things. So one of them shouted out to people, this woman is setting fire to Qurans. And so they, I mean, ironically, she'd been trying to uphold religion and they then all attacked her. And the people that attacked her, if you look at the footage, which unfortunately you can see, um, she, were not sort of like long bearded Taliban types in villages. They were young urban people in Kabul who then took, um, f um, filmed it on their mobile phones, put it on Facebook or YouTube um, as if they were proud of it. And you could also see on this footage that a lot of people were standing by. And it's horrible footage. You see her trying to stand up and pleading for her life and then them carrying on. So, you know, this shows how far things still have to go for women. And it worries me that as the international community sort of draws away from Afghanistan, that these women that we all made lots of promises to are not protected. And some of the women that we used as sort of models and, and had at international conferences around the world and encouraged to speak out are now living in fear of their lives and are in hiding. We've got um, a lot of, um, we've got a very eclectic panel, as you can see, we've got a lot of questions, so I'm afraid we'll um, have to leave that subject there to move on to our next question, which comes from Sam Valentine. Uh, my question is for Norman. Um, in 2009, I was diagnosed with a brain tumour in my left frontal lobe. Um, prior to surgery, I read your book um, and credited it with, your, with boosting my conf confidence of recovery from a complete loss of speech that followed my inner weight craniotomy procedure. Um, given many are faced with similar post-operative and other organic health issues, are there any, any innovative new non-conventional and evidence-based methods of rehabilitation which could accelerate the recovery of patients facing significant brain injuries? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, one of them that is described in the brain that changes itself uh, was done by Edward Taub, and what he discovered was that after any kind of damage 
um, to the brain from a stroke, but what happens is uh, there's a lot of inflammation, and this would apply too when there was a surgery and there would be a lot of cutting and inflammation. And a person tries in the period where there's this inflammation and also chemical chaos right after the, the damage to move, and the brain learns that movement isn't possible. And so it shuts down that circuitry. It's called learned non-use. And so he developed techniques originally to help people who had, had strokes. So if a person had a stroke, let's say, that affected the right hand, what most people would tend to do is use the left hand much, much more. He would put the left hand in a cast and then incrementally train up the other hand and reawaken the dormant circuitry. Because when there's um, brain damage, we used to think that if a person lost 90% of the function, let's say, of their right leg after a stroke or a traumatic brain injury or something like that, um, that 90% of the cells that process movement must be dead. But what I argue in The Brain's Way of Healing is that the literature really shows that some of them are dead, some of them are, um, we're used to getting input from the cells that are now dead, so they don't know what to do. Others of them are firing at irregular rates, and others are getting the signals coming from the cells that are firing at irregular rates. So you have what I call a noisy brain. And there are a whole bunch of new approaches that allow us to resynchronize the firing of the brain. And in the case of even speech, you know, how do you put um, a cast on speech to make a person who's lost speech uh, be able to speak again? And Taubin and a number of people in Germany invented certain kinds of language games that had rules. So the rules functioned like speech. Initially, they would be allowed to point to things, and then they would have to make a noise, etc. But there are a number of ones. Light can be helpful uh, in reawakening the circuitry. So can sound. So can something called neurofeedback. Uh, so it's never a good time to have this kind of personal catastrophe. But there, there are some new things indeed available now that we know the brain is plastic and activity changes. That's the, that was so the core structure. insight in a way, wasn't it? That yeah. the brain is not hardwired like some kind of machine that can never change. The circuits can rewire themselves. Yes, with activity and mental experience. Yeah. We've actually got another question on this. So, oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sam wants to get back in. Go ahead. Um, the, the one thing that I could say... It was a four-letter four word starting with F and finishing with K. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I could say it. Re I was saying it repeatedly all the time. Um, when my boss came and visited me, I was swearing at him. <laughs> anyway, um, I, that would be more. That's why. Why do you think that's the case? Like, is it? That's um, more of a hard. I'm life. not sure, but for instance, in something like Tourette's disorder, uh, it seems that sometimes there's a different circuitry for for swear words. Um, so it, it may be that maybe you were a little angry too. Um, but it wasn't. Perhaps it was an opportunity to tell your boss what you actually thought of it. <laughs> your brain just took it. <laughs> We've got another question on this. I'm going to go to that one. It's from uh, Lyle Nudgy. I'm sorry to your boss, obviously. <laughs> All right, so yeah, I also have a question for Norman. So I'm an optometrist, and I read that you had one of your cases was about um, helping restore some vision in a patient who had end-stage uveitis. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I think it's great that um, you have neuroplasticity as an avenue of treatment, especially for people where conventional um, methods of uh, medicine and things like that don't really work out for them. But I wanted to know your opinion on where you draw the line um, in the risk of choosing neuroplasticity over those conventional modes of treatment, especially for illnesses and conditions that tend to have a chronic or progressive or irreversible nature? Well, a lot of the people I write about, almost all the people I write about, have been told that they would never get better. So it's not a difficult uh, decision to make. They've, conventional medicine has said, I'm sorry, there's nothing that can be done. And a lot of that comes from experience, but the problem is because people believe the brain was like a machine and hardwired, machines don't rewire themselves when they're damaged. And so there was this doctrine of the unchanging brain that arose. And if you were raised uh, or, or in that, if you, were t if you went to medical school or you trained as a healthcare professional during the period, to, which is really till very recently when the doctrine of the unchanging brain was, was dominant, uh, any kind of hope feels like false hope, because by definition it's not supposed to happen. 
Um, but you know, complementary medicine, it, alternative medicine is about using techniques instead of mainstream medicine. Complementary medicine is about using techniques that complement or can go with mainstream medicine. And sometimes the neuroplastic techniques, often they go with uh, mainstream medicine and sometimes they can replace it. Okay, we're going to uh, move on. We'll come back to that subject. We've got some interesting questions on that. But you're watching Q&A. We've got some different questions. We're here with the Sydney Writers' Festival. The uh, next question comes from Farah Alam. As money, technology and information move freely around the globalised economy, how much longer can governments expect to prevent the free movement of people? Should migration be recognised as a human right? Mohsen Hamad, we'll start with you. You've written about this, and it's a particularly um, uh, cogent question at the moment for Australia and for Europe with uh, thousands of people stranded at sea. Well, I think, I think there's, there's two things going on. <clears throat> I personally do believe there should be a fundamental human right to migration. I think that if we can accept that people should be able to speak their mind, worship or not worship as they choose, love of a gender that they choose, um, to then say that if people are massacring your town, you shouldn't be able to meet, move, seems you know, a very strange limitation. So I, I do believe that there should be such a right. But I also think there's a natural human fear of people moving to um, where you are. And um, particularly if you're living in a wealthy country, um, having people who are less wealthy move to that country, it's, it na it's natural to be afraid of that. So for me, in a way, it's about sort of coming up with a kind of balance of these two things. That, that we shouldn't say people who want to move are somehow criminals, um, evildoers, uh, wrong. In some ways, what they, what they want is a very basic and I think right thing. But we should also understand that people are scared of that. And so we can't insist perhaps on, on that right at this moment in human history the way I would like to see it insisted upon. But one thing which I think is worth imagining is, what do we think the planet's gonna look like in a couple hundred years? Right? Uh, a couple hundred years ago, there was no country called Australia. There was no country called Pakistan. You know, America had just barely been born as a country. A couple hundred years from now, I don't think the nation state, which is such a dominant form of organization today, is likely to be um, as potent and as powerful as it is right now. And I think we'll live in a much more mongrelized, mixed world. And if that's where we're headed, I think it's worth us thinking, okay, how do we make that transition something that we can collectively as human beings feel optimistic about, hopeful about, not frightened of. Um, and that for me means entering into a kind of discourse about, okay, how do we make movement of people into a kind of collective project that, that involves both being aware of people's fear, but also open to the idea of people should move, et cetera. And, and one of the things, um, if let's say you know that your country has to let in 1% of its population every year as migrants, that's just the rule, um, how might you organize your society? Well, you might organize your society so that people who come in get trained in their language skills and other skills. Um, you might institute laws that mean that people who've come to a country from abroad aren't discriminated against in, in pursuit of employment because you try to build a society that is ready to take on migration. So I think uh, for me... That's where the argument sort of yeah. uh, comes in at we need orderly queues to mm. allow these kind of things to happen. If people jump queues, that's the, the uh, phrase that's been often used in this country, if people jump queues, you have to stop the boats. You have to send them well, back to where they came you from. You know, and I, and I understand that. I mean, uh, but of course, in the countries where orderly queues are being insisted upon, there wasn't an orderly queue of people who came here in the first place, right? We're not talking about in, if you think of the United States or... Uh, and, 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 and by the way, I don't mean to say this as, in any way as, as you know, demeaning of, of Australia or the United States or, or countries that have been built on immigration. I think that you know, it's not like I'm scoring some cheap points. But I think you know, Australia, as it exists today, is a society that is born of migration. You know, human beings did not evolve on the Australian continent. Everybody has migrated here. Whatever wonderful well, except things. except for the original inhabitants. Well, but were... even they migrated here. Well, yeah. And so I think in a way. A very long time ago. Yeah, very long time ago. Um, but, I, I, but I think that in a way, whatever you see about the society, Australia, that you love and you think is wonderful, is built upon migration. So I, so, um, uh, I think queue jumping sometimes is, I understand that, that idea. We have, we have certain rules. Um, but, uh, uh, but 
the demonization that goes with it is, is dangerous. And I'll give you an example of this. So when I was in France on a book tour um, about a year ago, I was interviewed by perhaps 50 journalists in Paris, you know, all types of print and TV. And, and um, uh, I don't remember being interviewed by a single, you know, non-white journalist. And this is a city, Paris, which is a very diverse city. And so, um, you know, the experience of that for me as someone who's lived in London and New York where such a, you know, out of 50 interviews, the idea that there wouldn't be any non-white interviews is inconceivable, really. Um, suggest that, that, you know, in some way that society wasn't allowing people to move into these positions, wasn't encouraging them perhaps to move into the positions. Now, again, I don't think, you know, France should be demonized or, or you know, thought of as a, as a terrible society in any way. But I think that that does suggest that we have to think a little bit differently about it. And so the last thing I just say on this is, is, you know, I understand that, yes, okay, queue jumping potentially is a bad thing and we need to have rules. Um, but, but in a way, uh, let's perhaps look at those who, who jump the queue, who break, break that rule. It's an infraction. Um, is it an infraction, you know, upon the same level of magnitude as somebody who is a rapist or somebody who is a murderer or somebody who is, you know, uh, 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 who victimizes their own children? No, it isn't, I don't think. So, so I, guess, I guess what I would say is, is if we imagine all the migrants who want to come to our various countries as the fellow citizens of, you know, their grandchildren will be the fellow citizens of, of our grandchildren, how do we approach those people? Um, and it might still be, we say, okay, well, we can only deal with a certain amount at a time because we'll be too scared and the reaction will be too powerful. But still, we can even say that in a tone of respect um, and, 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 and in a sort of gesture of equality and, and also sort of saying with the humility that we are keeping you out, not because we are right to do so, but because we're frightened. And, and so you're not evil for wanting to come. Um, we understand that you want to come. And so let's be a little bit more gentle, you know, with those who want to come and perhaps a little bit more gentle with ourselves. Caitlin, I'll bring you back in. Um, you come from a country built on migration like Australia. And uh, they say of America that, you know, in a certain period of time, the main language will be Spanish. Yeah. Well, I live in Los Angeles where the main language almost is Spanish at this mm. point. And that's, that's not a threat to me. But I grew up in Hawaii. I was born and raised in Hawaii, which is America-ish. But it's just a, it's a, it's a huge, I mean, it's a state, but it's a huge melting pot of all different cultures together. And that's what America is becoming. But I, I agree with everything that you said on that point. And there is a sense of, in America, there's a lot of people, a lot of good old boys, as we call them, who, you know, I'm an American, this is America, this is how it is. And you have to deal with their fear. You have to deal with their very real fear. There's something called terror management theory, which says that if you prime someone with death or you prime someone with something scary, they're going to double down on their prejudices and they're going to double down on the other and keeping the other away. Um, so you have to deal with that fear. You can't just say, well, you were an immigrant too. You're just a European immigrant. And so let's welcome everyone. You have to deal in the framework of that because those good old boys still have a lot of power in the United States government and in the way that things work. So if you're not addressing that psychology, you're not going to get, it would be wonderful if everyone could, yes, we understand your fear and here's this in a more enlightened tone, but you have to work within the framework. So you have to address the other end, why people are actually leaving their countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, Yeah, well, absolutely. I accept that people have, since time immemorial have left in search of a better life or fleeing war or disaster. But I mean, a lot of the specific cases at the moment are in Europe. The biggest number of refugees is from Syria. Yep. Um, and you know, there's a good <coughs> reason for that. And perhaps we should have done something about the situation there or should be doing something rather than this kind of um, panic about what to do about all these people in Europe, we have at the moment crossing the Mediterranean. I'm, I was in Italy and Malta a, a couple of weeks ago when there was a particularly bad week where about 1,700 um, died in shipwrecks. And, um, and I interviewed a Syrian doctor whose wife and three-year-old daughter had drowned. And I mean, it, it was just so terribly sad. And this was a man 
who wasn't like maybe a lot of people think about immigrants coming in these fishing boats from Africa. He was uh, a doctor who'd been earning $10,000 a, a month in Damascus, or in Aleppo rather, before um, Aleppo then became under siege and had fled with his wife and child and couldn't get in anywhere legally and had ended up in Libya and then paid um, $3,000 each to come on the boat across. And, and the and, main campaign of the Europeans now is to destroy those boats so that they're not yeah. available to use to take this crossing that, in, in which so many have a died. Bit I mean, those boats are uh, mostly rubber dinghies in, uh, coming from China who will just provide more, presumably. I guess the Chinese are quite happy at the idea that we're just going <laughs> to create more market. Um, and there's a lot of talk about doing something about the people smugglers and going after them, which, you know, great if you can do it. But actually, the people they're talking about going after, who are the people selling the tickets in Libya and places, are not really the main people. Those people are not in those countries. They're sort of mafias outside. So I think you're going after the symptoms again, not the real problem. We're almost out of time, I'm afraid. We've got time for one last question. It's from Carmen Osborne. Uh, my question's for Douglas. Um, online gaming and social media are now becoming the real life experiences of people. And therefore, um, how do you, the, the, the question is about those people becoming isolated from the real world. And then if you look at the influence, as you've said, of the internet and, and how that changes people's experience and rewires the brain, mm. is it possible to use that technology to do positive impacts rather than people being isolated and then perhaps looking to ISIL and other things as a way of, of making meaningful lives? No, I'm sorry, that is a question for everyone, really. We'll start with Douglas. Go ahead. Oh, OK. I don't really know about isolation. I mean, the thing about the internet is I'd never say, hey, Come on, come on over to my house, and we'll go on the internet together. We'll have a great time. <laughs> um, I bet we would, though. It, it, it is, you know, it is, an in, it is an intrinsically solitary activity, yet for an activity that's so incredibly solitary, the internet has this astonishing ability to create all sorts of new groups that never existed before and to reinforce the previously existing groups. Um, I think in even just in downtown Sydney today, watching everyone on the street is looking at this or they've got buds in the ears or whatever, but they're actually connected to someone else or some other people. And it might be just a misconception to think of just being solitary as being isolated. Uh, but some people also call it networked isolation. Hmm. Um, I, I'm sort of a misanthrope, and I'm always so shocked to find out that other people actually want to spend time with other people. But that <laughs> seems to be what people want to do, so go people. Um, <laughs> Douglas, there are travel companies now <laughs> offering, offering uh, digital detox holidays for oh. people who want to escape this thing that you're oh. talking about, the prevalence of this. That doesn't work. People, like, are you, I'm going to not do email for a month, and I'm going to go live on an island. And A, they go insane, and B, the day they get back is they have 5,000 rich, nourishing emails they can dive into. And, <laughs> and I, you know, I don't know about neural rewiring, but I do believe in neural reconfiguration. And once you get used to a certain amount of stimulus, especially stimulus that's about you because it's the internet, mm. why would you want to go back to this thing we used to call the real world? It's, it's slow, it's boring, nothing happens. You can't, see any, you can't see a kind of unplugged movement emerging anywhere. They can try, but it's too late. Yeah. That's kind of negative. Because of the fact that people's brains are rewired. Reconfigured. I mean, Norman, do they rewire? Yeah. Okay. They do. They do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> What happens to those internet rewired brains, Norman? I mean, is it all well, good? first of all, Douglas said, well, then, then they go off on the holiday and they, they go insane. Actually, Douglas, they're going sane, but it feels like they're going <laughs> insane to you. Um, it's just so different. Uh, look, it goes back in a way to the first fundamental question, which is, are we embodied creatures fundamentally or not? Um, or can we dissociate our bodies um, 
from the rest of us and then have this sort of networked intellectual or even a, in brain emotional experience. And I, 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 don't, I don't see it as, as, as rosy as, 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 <laughs> as Douglas. I, I see a lot of people have become, particularly young people who are raised on this, more fearful of interactions with people. You know, there's some people are more extroverted, some people are more introverted, so it may appeal more to, to uh, people who are introverted. Um, but I, I see a lot of it as a retreat. If you look at the content of the internet, um, a lot of it's really just business and advertising and uh, a lot of junk and uh, people are getting, you know, attention spans are, are going down. You could argue, well, that's just new and different. I don't think that's a good thing. Um, do you, I mean, do you see any impact on brain plasticity, the very thing that you were talking about earlier? I mean, um, doesn't it make your brain more nimble to have to go across um, cyberspace to seek out information, to find new things all the time, or does it ruin your memory to have to rely on Google? Well, you know, it's first of all, I, I mean, it, 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 there's a lot of multitasking going on, and there's more and more. I mean, my latest Macintosh now tells me every time anything is happening on any program, you know, every time there's an email or whatever, it's just, it's, it's pulling you away. When your brain multitasks, there is a net loss because you, th you think it's efficient, but actually there is a shifting time when you move away from what you've been concentrating, and shifting away and shifting back. So yes, it is less efficient over time. Um, and the, but, you know, this, this may change. Um, if people, uh, if, if computers become mobile, but people right now be, Mar Marshall McLuhan was right. Computers are pretty mobile. That yeah. thing in your pocket's got yeah. a lot of power in it. But people are spending so much time on the screens, it's rewiring them in many ways. First of all, people are, even though they, yes, they, they're using their iPhone as they um, walk to their job where they sit nine hours a day. They're very, very sedentary. That actually, if, if there's anything that decreases plasticity in the brain, it's a sedentary lifestyle for many, many reasons. The brain um, evolved to, to go to new and different environments. And we, when we walk, we trigger brain growth factors, which uh, allow us to make more connections and also improve the structure of our brain. So, Everything about the sedentary lifestyle is problematic. So, the, uh, so, the, the, so this world of being in front of screens this is not going to help people struggling to avoid dementia or those kind of aging diseases where the brain actually does need to be uh, trained Correct. to avoid. Yeah. But if you want to get idleness. dementia, it will help you. You know, um, I mean, seriously, it, it, it is a major, major risk factor for dementia. The other thing is, if you go towards something like Google Glass then what you're doing is you're hijacking your peripheral vision, uh, which is very, very necessary for all sorts of reasons so that people can, you know, give you advertisements or update you on, you know, bits of trivia. So all these things do rewire your brain. And uh, so you have to be, really be careful about what you choose to do. And McLuhan was absolutely right. The medium is the message. Um, most people don't understand how profound that is. People think, oh, well, I've got access to all this kind of content now. But when people analyze, for instance, uh, the level of depth people go into g in Google searches, and I'm not talking about s scholars who were trained in libraries, but most people just pull off the first couple of things that come up on Google. So although technically, um, you have we're, all we're, we're sort of, Sorry, we're sort of running out of time. I just got to get, uh, I, I know that you're a Marshall McLuhan uh, specialist as well. So yeah. I just want to get your response to that. Um, the internet's uh, rewiring has been painted as a, largely a negative thing. Oh, I, I wrote a biography of Marshall McLuhan mm. that came out about four years ago. Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Um, I was interviewing this guy in China and he had a picture on his desk of his son who was about seven years old and he's about 27. It's like, so, oh, well, what's the difference between him at that age and you when you're that age? And he said, oh, that's easy. Um, uh, he knows that the internet's the real world and I just have yet to get there. <laughs> and, I, and I think, I don't know if you can pass more, a moral judgment on a piece of machinery, which is all it really is in the end. Um, I think that we've probably never been smarter as a species, but we've never felt stupider. And there's this other thing, like, um, 
I'm really intelligent. I just don't have Wi-Fi access right now. <laughs> and, and I don't even know if you can put it on a moral spectrum. It, it's like putting telephones on uh, up for judgment. It's just, it's here. It's not going to go away. Um, I'm, I'm being told that we've uh, gone over time. So uh, whilst I'd love to hear what everyone else thinks about that, we'll um, avoid that luxury for now. And uh, that is all we have time for. Please take our panel. Norman Doidge, <laughs> Mohsin Hamid, Caitlin Doty. Douglas Copeland and Christina Lamb. Thank you. Our very special thanks to the Sydney Writers' Festival, which features all of tonight's guests, plus many more great writers. Now, next week on Q&A, the chance to interrogate the Federal Treasurer on the budget when Joe Hockey takes centre stage right here. Um, was it a budget for the tradies or the ladies or both? Was it designed to set us on the road to a surplus or set the stage for an early election? Join our special budget Q&A next week when Joe Hockey will answer your questions. Until next week's Q&A, good night.